This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Configure and deploy a consortium blockchain network in just a few clicks with pre-built configurations and enterprise-grade infrastructure. Spend less time on blockchain scaffolding and more time building your application. To learn more, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. Welcome to Epicenter. Uh, this is Friederike Ernst and I have with me... Sunny Agarwal. And uh, today we're speaking with James Prestwich, um, who is the founder of Summer and is talking with us about cross-chain auctions and um, how to improve the smart contract development on Ethereum with um, ideas that come from the UTXO world. Yeah, so, you know, I actually uh, met James first time about probably uh, 2016, I think. Uh, so I had actually given a talk uh, at Blockchain at Berkeley on uh, StoreJ, uh, which is a project he worked on in the past. And so he actually saw my talk. He reached out to me. He said like, oh, wow, this is like, you know, probably one of the best, like, uh, quick explainers of uh, StoreJ I've seen. And then, you know, I invited him to come give uh, even more in-depth talk on uh, at, at Blockchain at Berkeley. And he gave this like really cool talk about like, you know, how Bitcoin scripting and stuff works and they had at that time they were going through this process of actually uh moving storej from a uh, counterparty which is like built on bitcoin and moving it over to ethereum so he was actually you know from very early on i knew he was like super into like the whole like relationship between like different smart contracting paradigms and whatnot yes and he will talk, tell us all about how uh, they recently did a first auction uh reverse dutch auction um, auctioning off uh, NFTs on Ethereum for Bitcoin on the Bitcoin network. So that was super interesting. Yeah. And so, you know, Suma, they've been working on like all sorts of different cross-chain cross like contracts. So, you know, obviously I, you know, working on Cosmos, I'm very interested in like, you know, cross-chain stuff as well. Uh, but we focus more on like the side chains side of things while Suma is more on like, the uh, atomic swaps, like, you know, trading Bitcoin for Ether, like atomically, or, you know, let's say I'm selling some, or like, you know, this whole new cross chain auction stuff that they're working on, where it's like, you know, I can sell a CryptoKitty or Ether or some ERC20 on Ethereum for uh, Bitcoin. And so, you know, uh, they've been using like a Dutch auction system, which, you know, Frederick, you're obviously very familiar with. Um, so, you know, that was a very cool, like, kind of we didn't get or we got a chance a little bit to like talk a little bit about the differences between like you know what are the benefits of like cross-chain dutch auction versus like a fully uh on ethereum dutch auction which is cool mm -hmm. and then uh you know just uh for full disclosure for all the listeners uh you know i my my uh i actually my roommate or uh flatmate rather uh is actually rachel uh who is a uh you know one of the lead engineers at suma so you know i i i'm quite familiar with suma and i said you know i do have a little bit of a you know indirect personal relationship with them so just as a forewarning enjoy welcome to epicenter and uh today we're here with james presswich who is the founder and ceo of suma a uh you know according to their website a fairly young startup offering cross chain financial services. So uh, welcome to the show, James. Um, can you, uh, you know, maybe introduce yourself a little bit, tell us a little bit about what your background is and, uh, you know, how did you first get involved in the blockchain space? As you said, my name is James Crestwich, uh, founder of Suma. Um, previously, I worked with Chia on the Chia uh, BLS implementation a little bit, as well as on Chia script. And uh, before that, I was the co-founder and COO at Storage, a decentralized cloud storage system uh, for about three years. Um, I got involved in the blockchain space back in 2013 and have been working here full time since 2014. Um, I guess what really got me interested in it at first was uh, the consensus aspect is that we can use proof of work and we can use blockchains to bring thousands of nodes to consensus on something. I think uh, we've spent the last four or five years trying to figure out what that thing should be and it's still kind of an open question. But you know, it's fun. So what got you interested in uh, decentralized cloud storage? Well, it's one of those things where the 
The market for storage hardware is pretty fragmented. There's a few big manufacturers, but it's all split up between uh, consumers, enterprises, and data centers. And when you look at the market for cloud storage, there's really only two or three major players. Um, I, I think we could do a lot better, and trying to solve that problem is what got me interested in the first place. Mm -hmm. I got involved in storage because I was living in rural Japan and had way too much free time to think about things like this. So, uh, yeah, I guess I kind of stumbled into it mostly. Speaking of rural Japan, I actually saw on your LinkedIn that your, uh, you know, you, your bachelor's was in uh, Japanese, and then you just like sort of jumped right into like building decentralized storage marketplaces. And uh, how did you like, you know, that that leap come in? Like, how did you, uh, you know, what was the relation there? You know what my LinkedIn won't tell you is that I did a few years of computer science major as well before switching out. Um, Japanese was and still is a passion of mine. Um, I was expecting to take like two semesters of a language as an elective and ended up spending, you know, four years on it and then moving to Japan. I think like what they have in common is that you have to be constantly learning um, and all of the problems are hard and interesting. Yeah, learning a language is difficult. Learning a blockchain is very similar. You have to go into all of these intricacies and these special little rules that only apply in certain situations. It's half memorization, half investigation, and the third half is just like spending the time, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so you spent three years at the storage and then left. What happened? What made you leave? You know, I think a few of us were looking to leave for a while, um, and we went through the whole token sale process. We set the company up for success in the future, and they're doing great. And then we decided it was about time to move on. And so from there, you uh, went, uh, you know, you moved on to, you mentioned you were working with uh, Chia a little bit, mm -hmm. especially working with them on like, you know, I know Chia was really, uh, they were focused on like kind of like, improving Bitcoin script and like updating it. Um, and so you were helping about a bit on that. How did you, um, you know, get involved with that, I guess? Yeah, I ran into uh, Bram Cohen at, let's see, it must have been Scaling Bitcoin at Stanford, mm -hmm. uh, end of 2017. And so we got talking about the kind of advantages and disadvantages of Bitcoin script and the Bitcoin you know, like consensus mechanism design. Um, kept loosely in touch for a few months until it made sense to work together. Um, while I was there, we mostly worked on uh, Chia's BLS signature implementation um, and on designing Chia script. Of course, it's been you know almost a whole year since I left, and uh, they're still this, like doing good work on Chia script. Um, it's very much a work in progress. It's great and it has most of the properties that I want out of a scripting language so very excited about it and finally at the beginning of this year you started your own project right uh, Thuma uh, with two co-founders Barbara and Matthew uh, can you tell us a little bit about how how you know the two um, and what made you three set out and start Thuma what your vision is yeah, um, Barbara and Matthew and I all work together at storage um, and so uh, we already knew each other. We had a lot of experience working together in high pressure situations. And so around the beginning of the year, it just all made sense. Uh, we had all taken some time off and worked contracting on other things. And uh, around January, February, we got together and started looking to raise money to work on cross-chain financial contracts. And uh, you know that's how Suma started. What got you interested in cross-chain financial contracts in the first place? Yeah, um, so uh, towards the end of last year, I had a, you know, a lot of spare time to spend on learning about the intricacies of Bitcoin, uh, learning how blockchains work in practice. So all of the fiddly implementation details and the leftover bugs from Satoshi, and uh, one of the things that I spent a lot of time on was uh, atomic swaps. And uh, back then, I wrote a little blog post about how frustrating they are and um, 
how bad the user experience of atomic swaps is. And uh, you know, I thought it would be just a little one and done, you know, blog post complaining about stuff. And uh, you know, it kind of got me thinking about it a lot more. Is if you actually want to use these things, how can you improve them? How can you take them from something that's a like six hour synchronous protocol uh, with the free option problem with liquidity trolling issues and turn it into something that people could actually usefully use. And so after that, it was, a. Uh, I think I like woke up one morning with a few ideas like two weeks later and started just writing it down. Very few people have worked on these in practice. Uh, almost no research has been done into how you extend the protocol or modify it. Uh, so at this point, we have four or five good variations on the atomic swap, uh, which I've talked about some in public, but mostly just have notes on. And uh, we're building out software, seeing what works, seeing what people want to use, and uh, trying to put a product out there people will use. I see. So, I mean, I know, going through your uh, blog, uh, your personal blog, uh, a few months ago, you actually had a post talking about, or not a few months, maybe even a year ago, you actually had a post talking about why people should be less excited about atomic swaps. What changed? You know, I spent a bit of time on it, and part of it was figuring out a few ways to improve the atomic swap construction, and part of it was realizing that people were just trying to use it to do the wrong thing. Uh, it's really poorly suited to uh, exchanges. It's actually pretty well suited to options. You know, I mentioned the free option problem earlier. In an atomic swap, one of the participants has the choice to complete the trade or to cancel it. And they have that choice for several hours. So they decide what happens. In that sense, they have an option on the other coin, right? And so it's pretty hard to patch out this option uh, but what you can do is embrace it and use the atomic swap to do a cross-chain option. So it's not really that something's changed, it's that my perspective on it flipped a little bit. So essentially, like, you know, what you saw, what you originally saw as the bug in these atomic swaps, which you saw was like getting free options, you decided to sign like, like, you know, let's turn that into the feature, let's make the cross-chain auctions itself like the product that we're selling. Yeah. Yep. Cool. So... Maybe, like, uh, could you explain to us a little bit about how that atomic swap works and, like, why this, like, whole uh, option situation exists? Yeah, the atomic swap is a two-player game, basically. We want to exchange my Bitcoin for your Ether, right? And we want to do it at a rate that we decide between us, say, maybe 20 Ether for one Bitcoin, I don't follow price much, so that may be way off. But you know, we want to agree on this rate, and we want to do this trade with no third parties involved, all on chain, uh, so we can make it completely trustless, right? So what we're going to do is I'm going to make a secret and tell you the hash of that secret. And I'm going to make a Bitcoin contract that is payable to you if you learn that secret. And otherwise, it'll refund the coins to me after a certain amount of time passes, right? So I'm going to pay Bitcoin into that contract. You can see that I did this. So you know that you'll get those coins if you learn the secret. You're going to pay Ether into the same contract. Except this time, the Ether is payable to me if I tell you the secret. Now, when you say same contract, it's... But it's a same con like similar design contract on a different chain, right? Yeah, it's the same terms, but on a different chain. Mm -hmm. So you're paying into an Ether smart contract here. The smart contract enforces basically the same terms, but obviously it does it in Solidity on chain and Ether, which is completely different from Bitcoin script. So you're going to pay into the same contract terms payable to me if I tell you the secret, refunds to you after a certain amount of time. And so at this point, we've set up the atomic swap. I can reveal the secret to take your ether, 
you can see that secret on chain and use it to get my Bitcoin. So the free option comes in if I decide not to reveal the secret. So because we do this on chain, it takes block confirmation time. Anytime we want to change the state of this contract, we have to wait a whole block confirmation cycle, an hour, give or take. So I have at least one hour where I get to choose whether or not to reveal the secret. And that means I choose whether the trade happens or whether we both get a refund. And so if the ether rate moves against me, so if ether drops 50% in that hour, I can choose just not to complete the trade. And then you get stuck with the ether and I keep my Bitcoin. So in this sense, it works like an, options, an option contract right? I have the choice and you are just along for the ride. So essentially what's happening here is like normally when I do an options contract with you, I have to pay some sort of like premium on that, right? Whoever but, has the choice pays a premium. Right. And here I'm getting it for free. Yeah. In the real world, I would be paying you money and here I'm getting it for free. I see. That's not really a sustainable situation. Um, one of the other major concerns is once I have paid the initial Bitcoin into this contract, my Bitcoin are locked up for some amount of time, several hours, probably five or six. And you are supposed to send Ether into this atomic swap contract, but you could just walk away. And so this is the liquidity trolling problem is you can just cause me to lock up my Bitcoin for no reason, and then I lose access to it for six hours. And you lose nothing, and it costs me, well, a lot of annoyance and probably some money. So there are a few ways to fix these things. Um, the liquidity trolling is pretty complex to get into, but the free option problem, um, you can add a premium payment. Mm -hmm. And we can embrace the fact that this is an option. If you've listened to previous episodes with Marley Gray and Matt Kerner, you know that Microsoft is committed to providing enterprise-grade tools and infrastructure for blockchain developers. Well, the Azure Blockchain Workbench is perfect for organizations building consortium networks. Take the Ethereum Proof of Authority template, for example. It's ideal for permission networks where consensus participants are known and reputable. Ethereum on Azure has on-chain network governance that leverages Parity's extensible proof of authority client. Each consortium member has the power to govern the network or delegate their consensus participants to a trusted operator. And Parity's WebAssembly support allows developers to write smart contracts in familiar languages like C, C++, and Rust. Azure Blockchain Workbench was created on the same principles that drive all production services in Azure, so you know you're relying on secure, redundant infrastructure that can scale. And with built-in services like authenticated APIs, off-chain databases, and secure key management services, you can scaffold your infrastructure in just a few hours. To learn more about Azure Blockchain Workbench and how Microsoft is advancing blockchain usability in enterprise, check out aka.ms slash Epicenter and start building today. We'd like to thank Microsoft Azure for their support of Epicenter. So I, I know I saw one of your talks at um, a conference a few uh, months ago uh, in SF, I think. Um, and by the way, it was one of my favorite talks because it was like right in the middle of a bunch of like ICO pitches and stuff. <laughs> and you had this like 15 minute time slot. You just like went in, explained a bunch of technical concepts and just got off the stage. This was the most efficient technical talk I've ever seen. But yeah, so in that you actually talk about what you, that talk was actually, you know, you titled it Better Atomic Swaps. Um, and so there you talked about like mechanisms where you can actually like play with the timeouts and in include some additional constraints that actually make this uh, atomic swap process better. So can you explain a little bit about what, you know, a short gist of that talk that you gave? This gets pretty technical pretty quickly, but um, what I was talking about that day was a quick solution to the free option problem. Unfortunately, it can't be used with every chain. Uh, so this is basically like doing an atomic swap inside out, is saying that uh, both of us must fund within an hour, and then after that, it's mandatory for both of us. Um, either of us can back out within that hour, but it's mandatory after that. And so this kind of 
gets rid of the liquidity trolling issue, right? Because I have this period where if you don't fund, I can just back out and get my money immediately. And it gets rid of the free option problem because once an hour has passed, there's no more optionality. It just happens, right? Mm -hmm. um, the downside here is that it can only be used with certain chains. At least one of them has to support a specific uh, transaction expiry feature. So that side of things you can basically only do with Ethereum or uh, other smart contract chains right now. And so you might be able to do this improved atomic swap between Ethereum and Bitcoin or Ethereum and Litecoin, but you can't do it between Bitcoin and Litecoin, say. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is really interesting to me because uh, I came up with this when I was really investigating the differences between all of the deployed blockchains. You might notice that the atomic swap that everybody uses is perfectly symmetrical, right? Uh, we both pay into contracts with the same terms. What is really interesting is that when we start making them asymmetrical, uh, when we use different terms on Ethereum than we do on Bitcoin, uh, we can do some really powerful things, uh, like patching out the liquidity problem. I see. And so... You know, you mentioned also uh, a few minutes ago that, like, you know, there's different ways you can uh, create, you can parameterize these atomic swaps in order to create sort of different financial instruments or derivatives. And so, you know, we talked about, you know, we talked so far mostly about like options. You know, uh, I've been told that it's possible to also create things like futures or uh, other sort of uh, instruments. Uh, so, can you explain about, like, you know, you mentioned you had four like different like designs that you have and could you explain a little bit about how each of these work or what at least what they are yeah so we work on a bunch of things that are based on atomic contracts and we work on some things that are based on uh, spv proofs which we can talk about a bit later talking about atomic contracts uh, we've covered a lot on options and we've covered some of just mandatory exchange you enter into a contract and then it must happen, right? If we're willing to get away from just strict exchange of Bitcoin for Ether, we can actually use atomic contracts uh, to pay Bitcoin for any smart contract call on Ether. So for example, we can pay Bitcoin for ENS domains, or we can pay Bitcoin for NFTs. Um, one of the prototypes that we built is paying Bitcoin to issue new tokens from an ERC-20 contract so that anybody could pay Bitcoin to buy new fresh minted ERC-20s. The structure is really flexible and generalizable that way. Almost anything you can implement in Ethereum can be paid for with Bitcoin. Maybe to make this a little bit more concrete, so you did this recently, right? So basically, you actually had this contract that actually sold uh, a number of uh, NFTs on Ethereum for Bitcoin. So how does it work exactly? Uh, what actually happens to the, to the Bitcoins that I pay? Well, uh, we've actually done this two completely different ways now. We've done uh, minting using the atomic construction. Uh, so we've talked a lot about options. When we're talking about minting something fresh, we usually call it a warrant. It's the same as an option, just on fresh minted tokens instead of some ether that already exists. The other thing that we did very recently uh, was a cross-chain auction on some NFTs. And this doesn't use the atomic swap construction. Uh, this uses something new that we came up with uh, called stateless SPV proofs. I, I'm not sure where to start explaining these. Atomic swaps have to be pre-negotiated. So me and Sunny have to agree on this exchange or this contract that we're entering into. And then we have to agree on the hash of a secret and who holds it and how it all works. The real advantage of SPV proofs is that we don't have to agree on anything ahead of time. If I'm selling Ether, I can just set my requirements and let someone come in and pay me. This is going to get 
real technical, real fast. Uh, but the basic way it works is I want to sell 20 Ether. I have an asking price of one Bitcoin. Anybody can come in and pay me a Bitcoin and submit a proof that they did so. Uh, this proof comes in the form of a Bitcoin transaction that pays me, a Merkle proof of inclusion in a Bitcoin block header for that transaction, and then uh, a bunch of headers that come after that that have a lot of work done on them. So anybody can come in and show this proof to the smart contract, and the smart contract will validate it, which validates that Bitcoin was paid to me. And if the transaction and the proof and the header chain all check out, the smart contract will distribute the ether or the tokens or whatever. How do you make sure that this only happens once? Or how do I make sure that if I want to buy something off of you, um, I, I don't run the risk that someone else has had the same idea previously and has already started doing this? Because this is a timely process, right? Because you need you need a number of uh, you need to wait out a number of blocks until you have the proper proof mm -hmm. that I can come show you. How do you make sure that several people don't do this at the same time? The process does take time. Um, getting six or seven Bitcoin block headers takes an hour, sometimes more. It's worth noting that this is still strictly better than the atomic swap, which takes like four hours in the happy case and longer in the sad case. Okay, maybe maybe we can back up a step. The purpose of a blockchain, the reason these things were invented is to solve something called the double spend issue, which is what if I send the same coins to two people? How does the system resolve which spend happened and which spend didn't? Uh, obviously, they can't both be valid, so how do we choose one? The whole proof of work consensus mechanism and the blocks and the transactions are all about solving the double spend problem for digital money. So as a result, Bitcoin is really, really good at preventing double spends. Uh, it's literally you know, the only thing it was designed to do. So what we do is we make it so that everybody trying to pay me is also trying to double spend Bitcoin. So when I list my Ether for sale, I will attach to it a tiny, tiny little bit of Bitcoin. Um, right now we use 550 Satoshis, which is something like 0.3 cents, something like that. So they'll attach to it a tiny amount of Bitcoin and say, you can pay me, but if you want to get my Ether, you have to pay me by spending these coins. So the smart contract checks that those specific coins were spent in the transaction that's included in the proof, that's included in the block, that's included in the chain. And so anybody can come in and make a bid. They'll all use those coins to do it. And Bitcoin will ensure that only one of those bids goes on chain. Yes, I understand now that like, you know, Bitcoins, you give so model, make sure it's only one person can spend a certain amount of, uh, you know, as one UTXO and two transactions trying to spend the same UTXO, they won't both make it onto the chain. But given that, now how do you apply that to making bids in an auction? Like, you know, not everyone's bidding with the same Bitcoin. They're, everyone has their own Bitcoin that they're trying to bid with. In Bitcoin, we have inputs and we have outputs. So unlike Ethereum, where you have an account with a balance, in Bitcoin, you just have a bunch of coins with serial numbers on them and you spend specific coins as your inputs and you get new specific coins with new serial numbers as your outputs, right? And so what we do is each of the bidders takes the seller's small UTXO, that's an unspent transaction output, it just means some coins that exist and haven't been spent yet. They take the seller's UTXO and they add their own inputs to it so that there's more value, right? And then they take the seller's preferred output, that one Bitcoin I want to be paid, and they add their own other outputs to it. And so each bidder submits a Bitcoin transaction with the seller's input and output and their own inputs and outputs. So in order for them to do this, they look at the Ethereum contract, 
they see the seller's input and output there, and they extend that transaction. You know, they add more inputs and they add more outputs and they sign it and they broadcast it to the network. So that works really simply for set price orders, right? If I just say I want one Bitcoin, I can just say, okay, here's a transaction that pays me one Bitcoin. Add your own inputs, add your own outputs. What we've been doing recently is Dutch auctions. So that's a falling price auction, right? And we do this as stepwise. It's not a continuous price, unfortunately, though I think we can do that later. So the way we do this is using another Bitcoin protocol feature, which is time locks. When I sign a transaction as the seller, I can specify that it's not good until a specific time. Uh, we can do this in Unix time or we can do it in blocks. And so if I'm the seller and I want to run a Dutch auction, I'll take this one input, one output that are mine, my like 500 Satoshi in and my one Bitcoin out, and I'll sign that with no time lock. And then I'll make another one that's 500 Satoshi in and 0.9 Bitcoin out. And I'll add a time lock for five blocks down the road. So that won't be valid. Nobody can pay me that way for five blocks, right? And I'll make a third one with 500 in and 0.8 out. And I'll say that that's valid in 10 blocks. And I can make as many of these as I want. So I can set up a falling price auction by saying one Bitcoin now or 0.9 in five blocks or 0.8 in 10 blocks. And so when you want to bid, you see, okay, what's the latest valid transaction or the lowest priced valid transaction? And I will, if that's an acceptable price, add my own inputs, add your own outputs, and broadcast to the network. I pay a uh, price that de depends on time. Uh, and for that, I actually get something on the Ethereum network. Yeah. Uh, is that correct? Yes. So basically, it's it's always the same thing that I get on the Ethereum network. Is that correct? Yeah. So we're selling, say, 20 Ether for one Bitcoin. But after five blocks, the price will fall to 0.9. You still get the 20 Ether, but you pay 0.9. After five more blocks, it'll fall to 0.8. At that point, you're paying 0.8 Bitcoin for 20 Ether. So the price will fall this way until someone out there in the world wants to buy those Ether for Bitcoin until it reaches some market clearing price, right? Okay, so how does it look from the other side? How does the Ethereum smart contract now know that it can release the, the Ether? So the Ethereum smart contract is just looking at proofs. Okay? It's not following the Bitcoin chain like BTC Relay does. It's just looking at a specific slice. So somebody needs to tell it about this transaction and about the Merkle proof of inclusion, about the headers. Uh, the way we set it up, that can be anybody. Right now, we've been doing it for auctions. Uh, we're going to build it into the client pretty soon so that it'll just happen automatically. So I will construct a proof. I will submit it to the smart contract, and the smart contract will check it. So what it does to check it is it sees that it's a validly formatted Bitcoin transaction. It checks that it's spending the seller's input, so it knows that the seller is okay with this price. It checks that the transaction is included in the blocks Merkle tree by validating a Merkle proof of inclusion. Bitcoin typically has 2,500 transactions in a block, so that means 12 to 13 hashes in the Merkle proof. And so it validates that the transaction is included in a block, and then it starts checking work. So the nice thing about proof of work is that you can check it. So we take this block header, and we check the hash of that block header, and we compare it to the difficulty target. And then we take another header, and we verify that it, is, that it references the first one, and that it has enough work on it. So we hash it and compare it to the work target, and we repeat that or five more times. So the goal here is that we get not 100% certainty, but a very high degree of certainty that this transaction was included in Bitcoin. 
in the Bitcoin main chain. Exactly, in the main chain, because otherwise you could just use an uncle chain and uh, try to build blocks on that. That would be counteracted by the fact of the of the work. Is is that correct? Yeah, is uh, you know, work is expensive. When we're making six Bitcoin block headers, it takes uh, quite a bit of electricity, a small mountain of ASICs, and uh, quite a bit of time. So the Bitcoin main chain makes block headers at about about every 10 minutes, right? So if I have 10% of the Bitcoin hash rate and I want to make some fake headers, I can only make one every 100 minutes. And if I spend 10% of the Bitcoin hash rate, I'll get 10% of new Bitcoins on the main chain. But if I spend it on fake headers, I won't get any new Bitcoins. So we've never actually checked that this SPV proof is really included in the main chain. What we check is that somebody spent an awful lot of money building it. What is the benefit of doing this like stateless model over, uh, for example, using BTC Relay, which like, you know, tries its best to follow the bit, like, like have the entire history of the Bitcoin header, Bitcoin header chain? Well, I think uh, there's a few different advantages. One is that I can write stateless SPV proofs in about two days while writing reorg logic in Solidity takes weeks and, or months. Um, one is that BTC Relay relies on relayers. And historically, relayers have uh, failed to appear. Last time I looked, BTC Relay hadn't been operational in six months. All the smart contracts are still there. They probably still work, but nobody has actually submitted a header to it recently. BTC Relay costs about the same as doing SPV proofs in the long run. Um, I'm hoping to get some more analysis on this out the door soon, but uh, I don't have a lot of free time to write at the moment. Because BTC Relay has to store information about every header and stores information about transactions and proofs. Whereas stateless SPV proofs are basically predicates. They can just be evaluated immediately and then discarded. And storage is probably the most expensive thing you can possibly do in Solidity uh, besides zero-knowledge proofs. And so we save quite a bit of gas by not storing anything. I guess for me the main advantage is that they stand alone. They don't need to be included in a larger context like BTC Relay or in a larger system. You can look at an SPV proof, you can figure out how much work was put into it, and you can decide your confidence level immediately with no other context. But so doesn't this like set some sort of like limit on how valuable of an auction you can do? Because like, you know, let's say the cost of me creating list of six blocks on Bitcoin is like, you know, a million dollars. And then, but I, I, that means I can't like auction that like one crypto kitty that went for like 1.8 million or whatever. You know, for, to parameterize a little bit, it's about $500,000 right now to create a six block header chain. Fortunately, that's not the only defense we have. So as I mentioned earlier, how much of the Bitcoin hash rate do you have? Because if it's 10%, it's going to take you 10 hours to make a six-block header chain. If it's 25% of the Bitcoin hash rate, it's still going to take you four hours, right? So unless you have you know, almost enough hash rate to 51% attack Bitcoin, it's going to take you a very long time to make a fake proof. So... Any honest buyer will beat you to the punch because they will have the main Bitcoin chain making headers for them every 10 minutes. And so it's not just a uh, dollar value here. It's also a level of confidence that a dishonest party cannot make a false proof in a reasonable amount of time. So let's say there's a system in which there's only a single buyer, no one else is buying, is idea that then the next step of secure fallback is that there will be a timeout. So let's say you're trying to defend against up to someone with 10% of the hash rate. 
for them to create a six block chain, it'll take them, you know, 600 minutes. And you can say, okay, this auction times out in 300 minutes. And so that basically means you're kind of secure against someone with up to like, you know, 10, at least 10% of the hash rate. Yeah. If you set your auction to time out in three hours, then you're secure against someone with up to like 30% of the hash rate. Um, there's a little bit of fiddliness here um, because one of the things about timing out auctions is that they can, that mechanism can prevent honest buyers from submitting real proofs. But the Bitcoin transaction that the seller created doesn't get invalidated. And so you can end up in a situation, if you're not careful, where an honest buyer paid Bitcoin, but the auction timed out before he was able to submit a proof. And so there's a lot of like timing related edge cases there, which is why we haven't implemented timeouts in this version. Right now, the safest thing to do here is to have the seller cancel. And this is something that can be done uh, fairly trustlessly. If the seller spends their own UTXO, then nobody else can spend it. And they've effectively canceled the auction and can reclaim their ether. I have a follow-on question here. So basically, you said that creating a six-block uh, six chain uh, on Bitcoin right now is a half a million dollars, um, and that's uh, that sits that sets an upper boundary to how how much uh, you can actually have in in an auction. But that's that's always assuming that there's just one auction going on at any one time, right? So basically, if you had if you use Bitcoin Network as sort of an anchor, if you had a lot of outgoing uh, auctions at the same time, this would no longer hold. Is 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 that correct? There's actually a few different ways you can arrange this. Uh, right now, every auction gets its own proof and has its own confidence level as a result. And the seller sets the amount of work that they want. We don't use like a standardized six header thing. The seller decides how much security it should have. So in the future, it's conceivable that we could be proving many transactions many Bitcoin transactions for different auctions in a single Ethereum transaction. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that and a lot of different trade-offs there. So I think we haven't sat down and mapped all those out yet, but uh, I'm confident there's something good there. I can somewhat buy this model for something like Bitcoin, right? Have you thought about how this like security model works for, you know, things like minority hash rate chains and whatnot? Well, uh, you know, it really doesn't, uh, for a few reasons. Obviously, with things like the Verge or the Vertcoin 51% attacks, it would be pretty trivial to create fake proofs just by renting hash rate. So, you know, in that sense, it's pretty broken for small chains. Um, the other thing is that Bitcoin is actually the only chain that we can do this for in Solidity. We're going through each header in this proof and we're verifying the work that was done on it. Bitcoin uses SHA-256, which uh, the EVM conveniently has a pre-compiled contract for. So it's actually really cheap to do SHA-256 in the EVM. But if you look at Litecoin, they use Scrypt. Zcash uses Equihash, um, Decred uses Blake 256. None of those can be done in the EVM efficiently. So for all of these like minority hash rate chains, I think it's not even an issue because we just can't do it anyway. Uh, Bitcoin's really the only chain that this can work with right now. I guess, uh, if we really wanted to, we could write zero-knowledge proofs of SPV proof for all of these other chains. So I could make a zero-knowledge proof that I know a Zcash SPV proof that you got paid. But that would be uh, really painful for everybody involved, I think. I see. This all seems like you're, you know, a lot of very complicated, uh, smart, like smart contracts. You're writing stuff on like the Ethereum side of things. You're writing stuff on the Bitcoin side of things. Rachel has been, you know, always complained to me about like, you know, how complicated a lot of this stuff is. And so, 
you know, I know that you guys have this other project called uh, Ryman, which is sort of a, you know, I guess the goal here was to make all this like, you know, in the Ethereum world, uh, you know, there's a lot of tooling around like solidity and whatnot that makes it like, you know, not a pleasure, but like at least usable to like write like complex smart contracts. And so is this sort of what like Ryman is or, you know, can you actually just give us a brief rundown of what this uh, Ryman project you guys have is? Sure. Um, so this is something that we started back in March, and it's basically a transaction construction library for Bitcoin and other similar chains. Right now it supports 20 odd chains, including Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. Uh, I need to update it for the new uh, Bitcoin Cash children, but um, it supports Zcash, Decred, Vertcoin, Monacoin, Aurora Coin, Grossel Coin, and like 15 other coins that I don't know. So the goal here is to make it extremely easy to build transactions. We've talked so far about time locks and a little bit about the SigHash stuff as, and um, I have like long 10 page blog posts about how these things work. But the goal of Remon basically is if you know what you want your Bitcoin transaction to be, you should be able to make it and get it on chain within 10 minutes. It's a toolbox for building Bitcoin transactions. If you want to, you know, as the seller, make this partial transaction and sign it, and then the bidder needs to come in, parse that, look at it, validate it, and then add their own stuff to it, no wallet is going to do that for you right now. Uh, Electrum won't do that, Jax certainly won't, and most wallet devs won't even know what you're talking about or what any of this stuff does. Uh, so we went and wrote a whole library for just building Bitcoin transactions simply and quickly. And we use it for everything we make now, just because it's the, you know, we built the tool we wanted to use. I'm uh, quite familiar with uh, a project called Ivy, which is uh, something one of my friends, uh, Dan Robinson, uh, wrote while he was working at Chain. And so what he, what, what he was doing there was he created like a higher level language that, um, you know, a declarative smart programming language that compiles to Bitcoin script. So it basically makes it very easy to uh, write like, you know, interesting financial contracts and have them compiled to Bitcoin script. Is that, you know, similar to what Ryman is doing or is it something a little bit different? Am I like, are these complementary things or are they like, how, how do these two pieces fit together? These are definitely complementary things. I've looked at and used Ivy a little bit and it's very good. Um, so the script is really just a pretty small part of the transaction. Um, in legacy transactions, it goes in as part of the input. Uh, each input has what's called a script sig. And uh, for segwit transactions, it's in the witness. So what the script does is it validates that you're allowed to spend those coins. It's kind of a smart signature scheme. So in Ethereum, you just use ECDSA digital signatures and you know one key, one account. In Bitcoin, we can set up smart signatures with additional spending conditions on them. So you can say this signature is valid only after next week. Or in addition to having a signature, you must also know the pre-image of a hash. So Ivy is intended to make it so that you can write more complex scripts more easily. Uh, Remon is intended to make it so that once you have the script you want, uh, you can just shove it into a transaction and put it on chain immediately. It's really like two parts of the development stack here. I see. So, you know, would it be like fair to almost like categorize it, given that, you know, people are probably more familiar with the Ethereum development environment, uh, would it be fair to call Ivy sort of like Solidity and uh, Remon sort of like the Web3 library? I think that's a pretty fair analog. Um, generally speaking, uh, everything in Bitcoin is going to be a bit smaller and tighter than stuff in Ethereum. 
Um, so Remon has a lot fewer features just because Bitcoin has fewer features. But I, I think that's a pretty fair analogy is Ivy is a language that compiles down to your, you know, the EVM bytecode, or I guess Ivy doesn't compile the EVM bytecode yet. Ivy compiles down to Bitcoin script, and then Remon helps you get that script on chain. I see. And so, you know, I guess kind of going on from there is, you know, kind of when we started this uh, episode, uh, we talked a little bit about how you were very interested in these like Bitcoin script style stuff. And, you know, uh, I follow you on Twitter and, you know, we chat a lot on like, you know, different Telegram groups. You know, you, you, you often take a lot of issue with like how the EVM model works for smart contracting and you really like the more... Um, stateless and like UTXO model of like Bitcoin style uh, systems. So, you know, could you tell us a, a little bit of your pitch of like why you really are heavily favor this style of smart contracting? Uh, definitely. But before we get into this, I, I wouldn't describe myself as a partisan here. Uh, I tend to lean more towards Bitcoin style, but we've spent this whole I'm talking about my system for connecting Bitcoin and Ethereum and improving both of them. So Bitcoin's design is around uh, security in a lot of ways. With the UTXO model and with Bitcoin's transaction model and script, we actually specify the exact change that we want to make. And we provide a signature and other forms of cryptographic proof that we're allowed to make that change. In Bitcoin, you know, we say I'm spending these exact coins, these UTXOs, and I'm creating these UTXOs. And this transaction is valid after this date, and here is my signature. And so what we do is we commit to an exact state change that we want, and we know that we will get exactly that or nothing. Whereas in Ethereum, when we call a smart contract, we really have no guarantees about what it'll do. I think that Ethereum developers have run into this uh, repeatedly over the last few years. I was around for the DAO. I was around for the parity wallet double feature a few years back, too. There have been a lot more big and small issues because when you sign an Ethereum transaction, you cannot tell what it's going to do with your money. You can have some pretty good guesses, but you can't be sure in most cases. And this opens up doors where people like miners and other users can interfere with your transactions for profit, right? If you're buying something in an on-chain exchange like EtherDelta, the miners can get in ahead of you and interfere with your order. Or another user can pay more gas and get into the block ahead of you and interfere with your order. And so because you don't know what your order is going to do, you're going to end up losing money that way. Whereas in Bitcoin, once I have signed this transaction, it's all or nothing. Like it happens exactly as I want, or it doesn't happen at all. And I think that's a much stronger security property. And it's really something that I uh, rather prefer in my money. You know, um, I, I like my money to be fairly predictable. And so this kind of goes back to that thing you were talking about earlier about like, you know, it's not that transactions in Bitcoin can't ever conflict, right? It's like, you know, for example, I could have, you know, let's say there's a one of two multi-sig between me and my buddy and we don't we both sent a transaction trying to spend from the same multi-sig and we didn't realize the other person also sent that transaction so it's we have like conflicting transactions but the difference is that only one of them will ever make it onto the chain while in ethereum both transactions will go onto the chain and it's up to like the smart contract to decide which one is valid and you know one of us will lose some gas even though we ended up doing nothing in Bitcoin, conflicts are resolved at the mempool level. Uh, so they're resolved before consensus happens. In Ethereum, they're resolved after consensus happens. Every conflict in Ethereum, except for uh, account nonces, happens in a smart contract somewhere. And so it's all happening 
on chain and it's being executed on chain. And as a result, everybody involved pays gas. Um, and that's the best case for what happens in a conflict is everybody pays gas. So in my opinion as well, this is a Bitcoin mempool level conflict resolution is a better property for programmable money. I completely understand. So basically, the basically what what you're getting is is that in an Ethereum transaction, you never know which state um, the transaction you sent out is actually acting on, right? Right, right. So do you think there's a way to ameliorate that without switching to UTXO model? So I think that people have done a lot of research into um, smart contract patterns and best practices that minimize this. So in Solidity Development, we usually teach people something called CEI, Checks, Effects, Interactions, which is that we make a bunch of require statements and then we change local state and then we call another contract. And that minimizes the problem here because any failed conditions that cause a conflict and error out uh, get caught immediately. There's been some like loose discussion of other like consensus layer Uh, resolutions to this. So one of the ideas I've toyed with is having transactions commit to the state that they want to act on. Unfortunately, this really interferes with a lot of the nice features of Ethereum. The great thing about Solidity contracts is that a bunch of users can interact very quickly and that they can all interact with the same state. That causes a lot of problems, but it also lets us have nice things like Augur and nice, like all of these smart contracts that we use. If each transaction commits to its starting state and is invalid if that state changes, what you get is basically a uh, one write per block per contract kind of thing, where once somebody has gone to Ether Delta, well, now Ether Delta's state has changed and everybody else who is going to interact with it in that block can't anymore. All of their transactions go away now. And so uh, I think it's really difficult to fix this issue without severely impacting Ethereum smart contracts utility. Essentially, there's like some trade-off going on here between like the security of uh, you know how users interact with the system, and you know the actual usability, like the functionality of the contracts. Yeah, and uh, I, I totally agree. There, there's a trade-off there. Um, you either get this guarantee that you know exactly what will happen, or you get to interact with other users in useful ways. So, generally speaking. For my money, I prefer to know exactly what's going to happen. But at the same time, it is obviously useful to interact with users in smart contracts on Ethereum. So I, I don't see like one model winning out here. Uh, I think we're going to find a lot of different use cases for both models. We're not going to end up with one dominant chain. We're going to explore the trade-off space a little bit. Yeah. And so you actually, you know, I saw another one of your blog posts where you talk about how you can write, you know, declarative smart contracts in Solidity using, uh, you know, a series of require statements. And so this is sort of like, you know, your proposal of how do you do more, increase the security model. It makes it, it kind of it makes it act a little bit more like the UTXO system. So is this like something you use in your smart contracts right now or? So it's not currently. It's a little gas inefficient. So to, to add a little more context here, uh, we talked about checks, effects, interactions earlier. Um, you can think of declarative smart contracts as checks, checks, and also more checks. <laughs> the, the core idea is that instead of having effects, we just make the user provide an end state. And we check if that end state is valid given our current state. So maybe if I want to have a multi-sig wallet, I make the user tell me what transaction they want to send to the network, and I have the wallet check if it's valid and check if there are enough signatures on it. The, the goal here is that instead of having the smart contract 
programmatically decide what happens based on the current state. You have the user decide what happens and have the smart contract check the user's work. And so this is a bit of a middle ground between the like hardcore Bitcoin um, all or nothing and the current state of Ethereum where it's a free-for-all where anything goes. The user can submit this transaction and know that the smart contract will invalidate it if they don't get exactly what they want out of it. So just to uh, you know, maybe help some of the listeners visualize this paradigm that, that you suggested here, it would be like in an ERC-20, instead of me saying a transaction, saying send five you know, WEF from Sonny to James, it would instead be, let's say the current state is I have 10 WEF and you have zero. I send it a transaction saying update state to five and five. And the system will say, well, you know, what's required to make this happen? It's that that would be the result of deducting the same amount from yours and adding the same amount to yours. Is this valid? If so, let's execute it. So that's kind of like, you know, you're, you're, you're declaring the end state rather than saying the imperative version, which is send something. Yeah, and in the contract, you're declaring what's allowed. So specifically for that token, you know, you're going to send in a new state, and your new state is Sunny has five and James has five. And the contract's going to check that uh, the sum of our balances has not changed. So James plus Sunny is still 10. So we didn't create or destroy any tokens here. It's going to check that, you know, you haven't approved someone else to move those tokens around. Um, and it's going to check your signature. And that's all it needs to know. We didn't create or destroy tokens. Uh, you were authorized to move them. So just write down what you said to do. Whereas a ERC-20 contract normally is going to actually you know, go in and adjust your balance minus 10 and adjust my balance plus 10. You know, this just writes down what you say to write down assuming it passes all the checks. Thank you. That was a super interesting and certainly very interesting perspective on smart contract design. We, we are coming almost to an end. Um, we skipped over one very crucial question earlier on, uh, namely, what's, act what's actually the business model of Summer? So we have a few candidates here. Right now, what we're concerned with is not how we monetize so much as how we get users. So, as I mentioned earlier, we ran an auction a few weeks back for 10 NFTs. We ended up selling all of them for Bitcoin. We got a tiny, tiny amount of revenue from it in Bitcoin, which is pretty cool. But uh, since then, we've run one more auction. This time, instead of selling NFTs, we sold Ether. Our Ether auction closed at uh, 4 or 5% below Coinbase's price for Ether. And so the people who bought Ether from us got a pretty nice discount. What we're going to do is keep running auctions every two weeks for the next several months and then step it up to every week and then multiple times a week. The goal here is that we get people actually using this stuff. It's one thing to talk about atomic swaps. It's a completely other thing to have a healthy market out there or SPV-based swaps. In order to have a business model, you have to provide some amount of utility to users, right? And so that's what we're focusing on first, is what useful product can we make? Get out there, build users, build out a real marketplace. And then the business model is going to be a natural result of that. Okay, so the business uh, model is still to be determined. Well, it's, uh, it's flexible. And so what's uh, next for Suma? So, you know, you have you guys have launched this uh, cross-chain auction and you're going to be continuously launching cross-chain auctions. Um, what are some of the, you know, next steps? Are you going to be rolling out like some of the, you know, option systems or uh, what's next for Suma? For a little while, we're going to be focusing on liquidity. Uh, we have this auction market um, right now, it's in a very, very early state. We don't have any tools for other people to list auctions. And uh, the smart contract's out there on chain, but uh, even if you figured out how to list an auction, users wouldn't be able to see it in the app yet. 
there's a really long technical roadmap for us. And I think, you know, what's next is refining the app, adding the tools so that other people can list auctions and uh, keep focusing on adoption and usage. We can circle back to more complex derivatives like forwards and options, you know, once someone actually uses the, the simple stuff. So I agree that liquidity is everything on a platform like this. So uh, people need to be need to be sure that they can actually get a decent market price. So currently, are you enforcing this in some way? So basically, if no one turns up, do you close the auction yourself? Or um, uh, how, how do you currently handle this? You know, we haven't run into that problem yet. So we let the previous auction close at a discount, right? We think that we will continue doing that for the next few auctions. After we open it up to other sellers and have good tooling there, we'll let everyone decide what to do for themselves. Very cool. Well, we're, that's uh, our time for the show today. So, um, you know, I for all of our listeners, I have really like you know suggest reading a lot of uh, James's blog posts. Like there are some of like the most like technical blog posts, but like you know very well written. And so we'll definitely link that down in the show notes. So uh, we'd like to thank you, James, for joining us today. And uh, it was great to having you on the podcast. I learned a lot about, uh, you know, Bitcoin script and like atomic swaps and, you know, part of the world I never really touched and I have always wanted to learn more. So that was really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. If we, if we ever have more time, we should probably go over like uh, inter-blockchain protocol versus stateless SPV versus stateful SPV versus atomic. But uh <laughs> Yeah, this has been really fun. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you, James. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.